Thanks. 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 Th
uh, TripAdvisor, we're, you know, we use a lot of open source software, but we're not publishing our serverless code out for open source because you don't even want to see it. It's not actually usable. But I have worked, uh, you know, in my spare time on open source projects, and one is Mail in the Box. So Mail in the Box is a one bash script uh, solution for running your own mail server, full stack, configured for, you know, relatively good security. Um, and I used it for a couple years, and then I was stuck uh, because it was pinned to Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, it was like reaching end of life, and the maintainers were like, we're busy people, we don't have time to do this, this isn't our full-time job, so I got to become a contributor, and I got to open a pull request, and I went and did all the things to get it working on the 4X kernels with uh, Ubuntu 18.08 or whatever it is. Uh, and then that was great, it got accepted, and a month later, you know, I was able to use the software without having to do a bunch of hacks to make it work. It's supposed to be just, you know, one-stop shop, so you can, you know, a lot of people get in that journey, they start off as a you know, user of open source software and end user, and then they find themselves uh, contributing. And that's why we want to keep UX in mind, even on the dev side, because these, these uh, roles are very fluid and people can be from one to the other. And we need a good UX for both. So let's get into actually kind of the meat of our presentation here and what you came here to talk about, which is good development and good UX and how they overlap. So yeah, I mean, if you're a developer, you might be familiar with Code Complete by Steve McConnell. It's like 10 years out of date at this point. I don't know if they're going to make a new version. But there's a whole bunch of good dev practices up here. I mean, a lot of buzzwords, testable, extensible, consistent, reusable, uh, separation of concerns, um, lots of things to consider when writing good code. And on the UX side, there's so many best practices there, too, none of which could be really boiled down to just one word like a lot of dev ones do, so maybe we need a better book. Work 
in figuring out what commands to use in uh, this this question. And I'm not going to try to explain this question because I don't think it actually matters for what we're going to do, but you're free to read it. What they did is they took a bunch of Puppet users, I think they took over 90 users, and asked them, what would you expect the command to be? And they didn't come out with one that was clear to everyone. They generally kind of had like 40% here, 40% here, and then 20% on a different one. And out of the three that they proposed, infrastructure status were their most popular. Puppet status because it's simple, it's short, and puppet infrastructure status because it's specific. They did not like puppet enterprise status, which was made up by their team and no one ever used. Because it's not something that people use in other applications. So what they ended up doing was calling it actually puppet infrastratus, where infra is an alias for infrastructure, so you could do both. And this is great because it's specific, it's shorter, and it's clear. All right, so that was a lot of talking by Katie, so let's get back to me. Uh, we're looking at some code. Um, and uh, in this case, I wanted to talk about using readable code uh, you know, over clever code. So I had a great example, actually, of TripAdvisor code that's horrible that uses streams that really shouldn't use streams. Hopefully, you guys are familiar with streams. It's just functional syntax in Java. Uh, and I lifted this from some guy who was like, and modified it a little bit. But you can see here, look, it's doing stuff, and it's functional. And I love Scala, and I love Kotlin, and it's great. But if you come into my code base and you start doing this, then you're going to get another job because this is the worst. So we can see, you know, you can't even really tell what it's doing. If you look at the next slide, oh look, we've actually just got two for loops and we're done. That's all it's doing. There's no streams. And some of you might say, oh, well, who really cares? You know, I understand that. Um, you know, everybody at my company understands it. Well, when you have a problem in production in a web server, um, the top one is the stack trace you get for that function, and that bottom one is the stack trace you get for the two for loops. Um, now again, you're like, oh, it says divide by zero. It has the location. No big deal. Well, when that's strapped in 10,000 Apache and Coyote stack traces, and there's nested lambdas and there's all this other stuff, you're going to really wish that you'd done it the simple way. Use the constructs appropriately. Use them to extend functionality, to make things easier. Uh, don't just use syntactic sugar. So that's an example of like keeping good UX practices on the dev side. Uh, someone comes in your code base, it's easier to understand. It's easier to fix bugs. That's going to improve your end user experience. It's going to make it easier for you to like solve problems that users are reporting in real time, to stop losing money, stop bleeding. Um, and that's really valuable at crunch time. So let's get into our second principle, which is performance. So performance is the actual and perceived speed of your application. It's a little bit of both. Because what people notice really
option they have, so you can do the processing behind the scenes. So here on the left, we have non-optimistic UI, where someone is typing out hello world and sending, and then it processes and then posts. And you see the scenes really slow. Uh, there's a big gap, you're not allowed to move on, you're kind of blocked. Uh, versus on the right, someone writes hello world, and it gets posted right away. But the processing is just happening behind the scenes. So the processing time on both of these is identical, but one of them feels a lot snappier and has a much higher perform perceived performance. So yeah, Katie's actually, her example actually is a great example of how uh, we talk about client-side performance and, uh, and time interaction and contentful first paint and all these other terms that we can use, run metrics. But uh, performance backends actually matter a lot. In her example, I wish we could go back, but this is Linux, and when you hit the back button, it doesn't actually work. Um, the uh, thing is just posting a string, right, and storing in a database somewhere. So all of that time is just network latency, hopefully, uh, network latency from you to the backend server. Um, um, which you can obviously optimize using CDNs or you know other edge upload pipelines. I think Amazon has one now. Um, but it could also be you know inter uh, you know say you're in Colo or you're in like you know a cloud somewhere. If you're not configuring your uh, you know your services properly, it could be you know latency between those services. It could be a very overloaded database that's taking a long time to return. If you want to have application snappiness, if you want to have like people be like, man, this thing really works. You can't just focus on the client side. You do have to have performance back performance backends, and you have to have them configured properly. This is the kind of backend that I really <laughs> So yeah, another aspect of uh, you know uh, user experience is sort of the DevOps experience, right? And that's something got super buzzwordy like I don't know two three years ago. It's still pretty buzzwordy now. But uh, for your developers, I mean, you can talk about how oh we get so much productivity out of uh, microservices, right? It's so easy to do pull requests and deploy and all those things. Well, uh, if your build takes a long time and or your CI pipeline takes a long time, then it's not actually that fast because you're running these things for every commit. And this is actually a problem we have. You know, at Trip, we have a huge legacy code base. Just giant Gradle, build.gradles all over the place and it takes a long time to build. And we have, you know, up until recently, we weren't really doing much to improve that build time and it was killing us from a productivity perspective when you consider we have like 500 developers waiting 15 minutes for like a full build. So focus on it, you know, devote resources to it. It might not be, you know, full bottom line. It might not, you know, it's always going to be a cost center, but in my opinion, it's one of the things that you can use to accelerate your, uh, you know, development process. And it's going to lead to better code too because people aren't going to want to take shortcuts. Um, you know, they're not going to want to do things to try to bypass the normal workflows. Um, and you're going to result in a more uh, performant, you know, bug-free application. Plus your contributors will like you more. So let's go into our last principle, which is support. So support is the explicit details about how something works. And this can be in a lot of ways. So just as a random assortment of things that could classify as support. There's your tool tips and your UI that people will hover over or click over and get more information. End user help documentation. On the contributor side and figuring out your bugs, writing good comments, writing good commit notes, documenting your command line interface with help. Also that can be part of your support is utilizing frameworks and tools that already have a lot of support. So if you use something established that has a big community that has a lot of support, that's less that you personally have to do or your project has to do. Um, and the same with growing a community of users. And another way you can really communicate support is through product and security updates, communicating those and producing those. because you know I have a principle for all of these, is knowledge bias. So as a person who designs or builds or works on something or is engaged with it in any sort of deep way, you have far more domain knowledge than your user and you cannot help that because you look in the code, you thought about how it's gonna work, you're really in it. And that means you're really prone to design things that make sense to you but are not clear to others. Missing information, stuff that's very implied in your head but like is not implied to the rest of the world. And this is incredibly human and normal to do. So you're gonna fix this with one, addressing your assumptions. You see that we did that right at the top of our presentation. We talked about what we're assuming about you and assuming about your knowledge so we could better 
start this talk to account for what we're assuming about you. And the other thing you can do to really combat knowledge bias is to give a lot more information than you think you need to. Uh, don't assume people know anything. Uh, just give a lot of information. And if you're writing documentation, try not to skip any steps that seem obvious, but instead say them explicitly. And one way that you can really uh, improve the experience for people right away is to write really good error messages, like these ones, right? No. So these are awful error messages. They're vague. They're not really connected to anything. They're very developer-focused, uh, but not actually that useful to developers either. So how do you write a good one? So a good error message has a couple things in common. It's clear. Is specific, it's relevant to whatever the user is doing at that moment, it tells them how to solve the problem, and just as a psychology thing, they're generally better if they're more positive and say, uh, instead of don't, you say do, um, and stay away from really negative words, people respond better to that. So let's take actually the, one of the examples that I grabbed a moment ago, and I took it from the really grainy screenshot into um, just like the pattern fly styles, which if you're more interested in pattern fly, there's a booth outside. Uh, so <laughs> um, and you see here that it's got a really bad error, error messages. There is no value for the required value state. I mean, anyone know what that means? Richard? Well, awesome. Because it took me actually a really long time to figure out what it meant when I was trying to clear it up. Um, and what I did was I rewrote this error message to be more specific, state is a required field, and also tell the user what they can do to fix it, which is choose a state and search again. I also highlighted the state with a red border that's a little thicker, so you can see it even if you're colorblind, uh, to really pull out that error. And this is a lot better. Uh, we can actually go one step further in this design to make it better and that is to prevent them from making the mistake in the first place. So by moving the field underneath, when you read, people read top to bottom, left to right, so things that are over not in the flow of how you're reading are easy to miss. So by moving state right underneath, we are not only providing more context about the error, but we're making it a little bit easier for people to not make that error in the future. I also added required asterisk stars, which go an awful long All right, so it's not just the client side, though. So the examples that Katie put out for her messages are garbage. And they're not just garbage to clients, as she said. They're also garbage to devs. If I saw, you know, something, something value state in a log file, and that was the error message I saw, and it was something that somebody wrote, which is, I don't know if that's something somebody wrote. Box uh, web driver JS. So, until and unless there is Selenium in it, it won't open the browser and uh, manipulate the DOM. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I, I do uh, functional E2E testing on the Ceph dashboard. So mm -hmm. hypothetically, for like a code coverage standpoint, how would, how would you be calculating that or anything of that sort? This, uh, See, code coverage with, uh, with uh, front-end tests is a tricky thing. So there is, there is one tool called Jacoco. Java code coverage. So there is a plugin which you put in your repo and then you run your front end test. So based on which paths you are taking while running your front end test, it gives you some sort of code coverage, but that's not something to be a very, uh, so that's not something which is very reliable and promising, to be honest. So code coverage thing is mostly done on the unit test or an integration test level. Gotcha. Thank you. Any 
All right then. Thank you, everyone. And uh, just to let you know that this, these, uh, both this app as well as these libraries. So if an, if any one of you is using React or chosen in the, I know most of the Red Hat apps use uh, React as well as chosen. The Red Hat customer portal uses chosen drop downs. So if you are using any of these, so these things are on GitHub. Feel free to use them. Uh, I'll probably paste this in, paste the link in my presentation okay. for you to uh, check. All right. Thank you. stand in front of the thing. Hello, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I actually don't like NPM that much, so it's kind of thing have to work with. But in this case, it's a great example of how you can tell users to check updates and how to install it. I got a lot of pushback for putting this in as the example of the Genta. But anyways, so those are understanding, performance, and support. These are common principles to both development and UX, and if you can just sort of remember these, I think you're going to make a lot better of a software, which is all well and good, but sometimes you actually should think a little bit further past just these basic principles and actually figure out if you've got good usability or not. So I'm going to share two different ways you can do that. Uh, this is not a complete set of ways you can do it, but there are two that I think guys would find interesting. So the first one is to do a usability evaluation. Don't read this. Read this when I post the slides later. Read this one. So the basic concept here is that you're going to find some users. Find people who are not you, not working on whatever you're working on. They can be actual users. They can be people who are as close as possible to users. Um, I've run things past you when I'm just working. I run things past random strangers all the time. Uh, but if you're trying to get really good information, get as people as close as possible to your users. And then just give them your thing and listen to them. Have them do this thing called think out loud, which means that you ask them to basically take everything that's happening in, your, in their brain and make it come out of their mouth. So, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, so I think that the back button here is going to work to make my slides go backwards, but when we tested it earlier, it did not work, so I'm going to only assume it can go forward. And this is giving a lot of information about, say, how Google Slides works on Fedora. So, um, you're going to listen to them for as long as they can talk for. And then after they've talked about everything that they perceive, everything that they realize, then ask them a lot of pointed questions. You want to do it in this order so you don't lead them on with questions. But take notes on this and just fix the problems you find here. And you've done a lot more usability than a lot of people do, and you're going to get a lot of good feedback. But there are times that you're going to want to do something that's a little bit more involved, not just you know, stick something in front of someone and you know watch them use it and make mistakes and all that. Um, and I actually want to introduce you to another usability testing uh, method called uh, the Wizard of Oz. So it's uh, it's not actually dealing with these guys. It's dealing with the actual wizard. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this movie. It's kind of indie. Um, but Ed, you've got a Wizard of Oz. He's just a normal guy, but he is just like totally deceiving an entire city that he is super powerful. He's got her and smoke machine, and it looks awesome, and it looks like everything works, but it doesn't. And this is why this method of testing is called Wizard of Oz testing, because what you're doing essentially is you're pretending it works by, instead of coding it up so the computer will respond to different commands, different interactions, you just have a person sitting there in a different room copy-pasting your results in. 
So let me show you a quick demo that I put together just with like code share. Um, and it starts off with a user typing in a command. Ooh, hopefully this works. I'm not sure. Hi, um, you brought up a great point about keeping the design consistent for um, behavior, um, you know, not introducing new stuff that users are unfamiliar with. So how do you balance that with um, trying to come up with new ideas and being innovative and like the user interface and things like that? The mic's pretty bad. Pretty bad. Do you want to speak it to you? Into the microphone. Yes. Is that better? Yes. Okay, so you brought up a great point earlier about um, keeping the user interface and um, UX components familiar um, so that users you know, don't have to think about what they're doing. How do you balance that with um, trying to introduce new ideas and being innovative? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I want to address first is being consistent with other That's the same way it goes. 
So keep looking for consistency in how people interact with the world. Doesn't have to be restricted to just like, you know, the computer screen. It can also be similar to how people move in physical space. And then also you want to make it as easy to use as possible without learning a lot of complex things. So say we're going to skip all the complex gestures until you already got them right swipe down. And then iterate on that after your users have done that. Another more on websites like mine, create radio buttons and check boxes. I think that it's not good. But that's a great example of that. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to radio buttons and check boxes. I'm going to just do it the right way. All the time. No one's going to be able to do that. Buttons? Um, when you're working with uh, an existing code base that has a lot of uh, smart people contributing to it, how do you strike the balance of not commenting every line of code for new or junior engineers coming in to understand it versus not commenting every line of code, basically? Yeah, so personally, I mean, I don't comment every line of code. I'm interested in your guys' take um, when, let's say, you have an existing code base and you bring on a designer to help with something, and what the designer is suggesting is brilliant and that's what you should do, obviously, but the code base maybe isn't up to the task. Like, maybe it's architected in such a way that what the designer is asking to do is impossible. Yes, literally my whole life. Um, <laughs> so I manage a consumer product team and I also manage a platform team. So the consumer product team where this comes up the most. Um, and yeah, when designers come in and they're like, you know, it's, it's better now because the browsers are mostly here in the standards, but imagine six years ago when they weren't. It's like, we want to do fancy vectors, we want to do CSS animations, we want to do all this stuff. And it's like, sorry, it's organized, it's just not going to happen. So rather than going to your designer and being like straight up no, uh, you know, telling them, you know, the limitations and, and incorporating them in the development process up front goes a long way. And also making clear that you really value their contribution rather than like, you know, you know sort of pooing it away and saying we're just going to do it the way we've always done it. Like, let them challenge you. You know, we, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense to strike out. We just like decided to support IE6 forever and we're just going to not embrace new technologies and we wouldn't be, we're trying to do this like web components thing now and maybe act, you know, act apps and all that stuff. It's great. It enables all this cool interaction and all this cool data flow we could do before. But we would have never got there if the designers had pushed us. We call the design side. It's like be polite. You know, treat a designer on your team just like any other member of the team and valuable um, experience. And you know, just a week ago, you know, a designer specified a CSS animation and we were going to use the blank you know, the save icon or something like that. So it turns out there's a bug in Chrome and the CPU went to like 45 percent of the browser well, on the machine. Um, the machine got real hot. All fans kicked on. We caught this before it went live, luckily. Uh, we decided to do um, a JIT instead. You know, we worked out great. We got the sign, got what they wanted, we got what we wanted, and everything kept working. I also wanted to say that, especially building up what you just said of explaining, this is a great place where being aware of like your knowledge bias can be really helpful in communicating and coming up with better products because I know, at least personally, as a designer, sometimes I'll ask things and I'll get an answer back, but I don't have all of the background because the person who's answering for me knows that and they assume I know that. 
And this is where giving more information than you think is necessary can really help get you to a better place because it's going to also help your collaboration. So I say a great example of that. But if you knew what I meant by the thing went to 45% CPU and you also knew why that was bad, raise your hand. It's not all of you. It's actually not a lot of you. So that's a great example of like domain knowledge, right? Your designers probably also don't know why that's bad. You have to over explain it. You have to make it clear that like everything's going to come to a grinding halt. You know, if they're running anything else on the computer, that's valuable contextual information you have to give them. I wanted to add something to your comments about knowledge bias, and that's don't assume that people won't do things that are obvious to you not to do. I've worked enough in technical writing and support, and I've repeatedly sat in meetings and said, what about this? And the key developer says, well, no one would think to do that. And six months later, someone on the forum has done exactly that. So don't assume that because you know not to do it, everyone else knows not to do it. That's a great point. Yeah, that's like the best point. Like input validation is like not the thing there, right? Don't assume people aren't going to put in negative values because you would know not to put in negative values. I've seen web servers come down and stuff like that. It's not, not true. Could you talk? Could you talk a little bit about um, the effort? I know, like at Red Hat, we are trying to like make all of our apps look and feel the same across the different apps, across different domains. It's really seems like a difficult problem, um, and we're certainly still struggling with it. Um, could you just talk a little bit about uh, how these like UX studies uh, inform across different products, even? Yeah. So I can speak really specifically. Yeah. Red Hat, um, we have a design system called Patternfly that is an open source design system. You may have heard me mention it a moment ago. Um, and that's helping us make things consistent because we're doing a lot of research on how people actually expect all these inputs to work and then keeping it consistent across our apps and our entire app portfolio. So uh, the way that the UX studies work Tough to get this into a lot of places with a lot of different code bases, but it really makes it easier. 